So hello everyone and welcome to Plenary 3, Risk, Return and Retirement, Getting the Balance Right in the New Decade. And also welcome to those of you watching us via live stream. So we're not even three full months in, but 2020 has already brought us some significant investment risks and challenges. So we're bombarded by information on the virus, oil price falls in the short term, but of course we're in pensions, so we need to take a long-term view. So I'm joined by a distinguished panel of experts, some of whom are joining by a video conference, who are really gonna help us debate some of the big issues. So what role does good governance play? How important is understanding time horizons? What strategies do you really need to deliver a good balance of risk and return in the new markets? So I'd really like to introduce my panel. So sitting next to me is Michelle Osterman. Now she's the Managing Director Investments at Railpen. And then we have two people joining via video conference. So Nico Aspinall, who's CIO of the People's Pension, and Denise Legal, who's Chair of Brunel Pension Partnership. And both of those, as you can see, are joining via video conference. So the plan for the session is I'm going to ask each of the panel members to speak for around 10 minutes, and that will give us an overview of their scheme, their membership, and they're going to discuss some of the key topics that they focus on when they're thinking about their investment strategy. And then we're going to spend the rest of the session in a Q&A session. So please do make sure that you send your questions through on the iPad. And I would like to mention just before we start that we have really try to encourage our panel to disagree with each other because that makes for a much more punchy debate. So what you will hear potentially is some of the views taken to allowable extremes so that we can actually have a nice, sparky, lively debate. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Michelle to start off with, with um, your 10 minutes. Thank you, that sounds exciting. Uh, hello, my name is Michelle Osterman. I'm fairly new to Railpen Investments. Uh, I am the managing director of the investment business and I've brought with me just a few slides to walk through who we are, give you a sense for if you're not familiar with us. At a high level, there's a couple key things I thought I'd share. First of all, we're roughly a 30 billion, or were until last week, <laughs> we're just a touch under now, 30 billion pound asset manager. Uh, we're responsible for the pension benefits of 350,000 members across the UK in many ways affiliated to the rail industry, so they vary in their nature. Uh, it is constituted of 100 different clients. We refer to them as separate schemes, as they're quite distinct. Uh, I think we're up to about 107 these days. Um, many of them are open schemes, and many of them are closed schemes, some of them are open. The majority of our assets are actually open and DB. We have a fraction of DC assets as well. Uh, we are the fifth largest UK pension scheme and we right now sit just under 30% assets. Actually, as of this week, we're probably tipping over the 30% mark of illiquid assets, which would include uh, the traditional private market vehicles. Uh, that's a number that we've worked hard to put on the books over roughly the last five years if, as we've internalized our investment strategy. Uh, we manage roughly 65% of our assets in-house to date uh, with plans to review that. I don't expect it to grow massively, but it is something that's likely to go up, not down, similarly with the illiquid asset exposure. So with those statistics, I thought I'd give you a sense for who we are. Um, additionally, I thought I'd share one key thing that we've recently been thinking a lot about. Core to Railpen is the consideration of our members. We're very centered around the benefits that we provide to them and trying to optimize the ability for them to receive lifetime income. Uh, we have a quite diverse nature to our different schemes. As I said, some of them are very small with only a few members in them and they're closed sections. And some of them are rather large with tens of thousands of members and billions of pounds backing those liabilities. With that diversity, we see a pretty well one of everything. And so I see Railpen as a microcosm of pretty well the entire pension industry in a way because of the number of sections we're responsible for. We took the time to think a bit about the, the distinct nature of these sections and we've started talking a lot about journey planning and looking at identifying the uh, investment objectives and the long-term expectations of each of these various schemes so that we can be more thoughtful, more tailored, more customized in our approach to their investment strategy and in particular risk management. 
I assume today through this conversation we'll get into that topic more. I'd be happy to share in more detail what we're thinking. But one of the early things I asked our team to calculate for me was so that I'd understand the nature of the scheme better. Each of the sections have a different benefit design. In fact, I've been told by our administration team that we have as many as over 500 different scheme designs, so benefit structures. They're quite distinct. Um, even though we have 100 different schemes, we, over time we've grandfathered certain features and we've had to accommodate uh, the various sections. So it's quite diverse in its nature. They'd have different retirement ages and different contribution rates, et cetera. So it's hard to look at it as, as one entity. But I did ask them to take a look for me at the nature of all the contributions that we receive, all the benefits that we pay out, and roughly what the growth of the earnings on the investments look like in the interim. And we got some really interesting insight out of this. I had spoken to a couple of our members and asked them uh, what they thought of the scheme, and one of them brought to my attention, he was quite surprised to find that after only about, I think he said three and a half some years of retirement, he was calculating how much he was taking out of the pension scheme as income, and generally, we only play, pay you know, a small amount per year. It might be, I think, on average, 8,000 pounds of income annually to an average uh, beneficiary. But he was adding up the sum of all the payments he was receiving from the pension and compared it to all the contributions he recalls making over his career. And he recalls what percentage he was paying and roughly what he was making over his lifetime. So it was a rough calculation. And he was pleasantly surprised to find that he had exhausted he felt he had exhausted or already taken in income more than the total sum of what he felt he had put in, in nominal terms, of his own uh, income in the past. And he recognized that he was getting his own money back, and we did the calculation, and roughly we find our average member receives about 10% of all the income they take out of the scheme is actually getting their own contributions back. Further, about 15% of what they receive in their lifetime income will come from what their employer contributed on their behalf. So that total means about 25% of their retirement income is coming from their joint contributions, which are about a 60-40 split for most of our schemes. And he asked me quizzically, how, where's the rest coming from? With this feels like it's free money. You know, how do I, did I, am I being, is this fair? And we explained that over his 30-some years of working life and then 30-some years of 25 years of retirement, we would expect that 50, 60-year span, uh, the investments that the contributions he gave us were compounding and growing. On average, we target around the 55 to 6.5% return. And when you compound that over so many years, it has a significant impact. And we explained that most of the income that he was earning uh, was actually a result of the investment gains. And it made him realize just how important that investment strategy was and how beneficial it was for him to be invested in a scheme like ours. And I think what differentiates not just RailPen but many of the large DB providers is that we have scale, we have long-term nature, we have relatively low costs, we are quite efficient, and we're able to use private assets to be able to get above typical uh, uh, risk-free returns. And so the some of all those benefits are what provide as much as 70 pence on the pound for a lifetime income. And this number was important to us once we understood this because it helped us connect back to the member. Remembering that what we do as an investment company has so much to do with the uh, viability of the scheme and the sufficiency of lifetime income. It's really a practical and uh, ideal way for one to be able to save uh, for retirement in particular. So I thought I'd share that statistic with you. I think it's uh, fairly simple. It is on average across all the schemes, and it's, it sounds like it's probably fairly typical with most schemes, um, but it did change our thinking a fair bit lately. And the last thing I'll share with you that may, again, provoke a little conversation later, which would be fine. Since we hope to discuss the topic of risk today, I thought it might be interesting for folks to see one of the frameworks we're using to think about risk. We focus a lot on investment risk. I hear that word bantied about quite a bit. And it's a bit of an innocuous term. It actually means a lot of things, different things to different people. But recognizing that we really have multiple facets of risk when we manage pensions, DB or DC, but this has a bit more of a DB flair to it admittedly, is the investment risk or the risks related to our assets are distinct and we spend a lot of time. We often refer to volatility and VAR as a measure of investment risk. But it's far more diverse than that, especially when one invests in private assets. There's a lot of distinct considerations, even reputation risk, when you're investing in a private asset in a difficult local environment. 
Um, Liability-related risks, such as mortality, longevity, inflation features that are embedded inside of some of the benefits. And then what we call funding risk. Funding risk is that overlap. It's the consideration of the asset risk and the liability risk in concert and asking oneself how variable might the surplus or the fundedness of the scheme be. And of course, we all spend a fair bit of time thinking about that, especially during valuation cycles. And then lastly, we think of the covenant as the covenant when we're managing uh, pension schemes for employers. Uh, they themselves have to bear the tail risk of all of this investment strategy, and it's their balance sheet which has to be able to foot the ultimate bill. And so we think of that covenant risk as, as that uh, safety net, if you will, that stands beneath the sort of actuarial work we, we use to think about asset and liability risk management. So I'll leave you with those, uh, perhaps just food for thought, perhaps very familiar, uh, but that's uh, what I thought I'd share on behalf of Relpin. Great, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, Nico for his views. So assuming that everything works via video <laughs> conference link. Oh. Nico, there you are, fantastic. Yeah. So you've got your 10 minutes now. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, so I'll also start by just describing who we are. Um, so the People's Pension is an auto-enrollment auto master trust. Um, and I think currently we're the second largest uh, master trust in, in the market, although I played this game with Emma on stage uh, last year because uh, it does depend on how you define uh, the master trusts. Um, so we are um, <clears throat> about four and a half million members in total, so about two million regular contributors. Uh, and those are staff from about 90,000 uh, employers. Um, I think the peak of uh, 19th, 20th of February, uh, we hit just shy of 9.7 billion. So um, our 10 billion pound uh, celebrations, unfortunately, on ice due to recent uh, market movements. Um, but, but, but really, I guess the more telling statistic is that we're taking contributions of something like about 3 billion pounds uh, a year. So uh, we are on uh, a very different journey, I think. Um, we were, the auto enrollment people will, will, will remember, uh, started in 2012. Uh, so the people's pension had zero value eight years ago. Um, so we've really come a long way uh, in that period of time. And then with the auto enrollment contribution escalations, um, which only kind of completed in the last 12 months or so, um, that's when we've got to that sort of three billion pounds a year level. Um, we are uh, a part of BNCE, that's a, a not-for-profit fund uh, that was started in 1942, uh, principally to look after holiday pay for the building trade. Um, so we've got a very long history. There's a number of other um, uh, pension schemes and uh, insurance products that, that I look after as part of my job, uh, but very much the people's pension is the, the, the focus for the future. So when I, when I look out to the future, um, uh, you know, the, the, the journey that we face uh, has to start with our, our members. Um, Auto-enrolment, uh, just by the nature of who was in pension schemes uh, before auto-enrolment, it's kind of focused towards younger people um, and also towards the lower paid. So traditionally, if you're a white-collar employee um, and maybe if you had a bit more, more service than, uh, than you were in a, a DB scheme or, or in an in a in-house to fund contribution scheme, so our membership is, is really younger. I think our average age currently is 36. Um, and uh, looking at the sort of national average earnings, we're slightly below that. I think um, we always challenge ourselves to look at uh, that kind of membership profile. Uh, we will have people essentially just above the auto-enrollment minimum contribution level of about £13,000. So um, quite a diverse population, but very much tilted towards the young and the, and the slightly uh, lower paid in, on, a, on an average basis. So when I think about that kind of investment time horizon, um, you know, if you think about a scheme with an average age of, of 36 years old, uh, and we're thinking about taking them through retirement and into a sort of drawdown relationship, we might have an investment time horizon for that 36-year-old of something like 40 or 50 years. So uh, really setting out a governance framework which is uh, appropriate for that kind of challenge uh, and uh, making sure that we can, can hold that to account without being too obsessed with uh, the current market noise is really my job now. So making sure that we can set out our stall 
to capture value for those members over the over the long term. Now, I was trying to to suggest some sort of a mantra for we want to have the best um, ten year performance fifty years in a row. Uh, you have to think about the kind of performance objectives that you can hold your team to. Um, but really, you know, the first phase, I think, of that sort of asset gathering, asset growth is about a 10-year horizon. So looking out to the world in about 2030. Uh, when we do the maths and we add up those $3 billion a year in contributions, we're looking like something like a 50 to £60 billion pound, uh, institution, uh, which will, I think, put us on current footing of something like the top 10, if not the top five pension schemes uh, in the UK. And when you look around the world and you see schemes of that sort of size or institutional investors in, of that sort of size, uh, I think all of them had longer to prepare to become a, a £50 billion pound scheme. So uh, a lot of my work is to essentially try and envisage uh, what that future looks like and try and learn the lessons uh, from those other schemes. Now, they would have gone through five different iterations of governance models in that process. So there's uh, a huge case study set for us uh, to go and learn the pros and cons of different institutional investors. Uh, and I do spend reasonable time with other institutional investors to just try and learn uh, the mistakes, try and learn uh, the positives from what they do, and very much uh, incorporate that into our views of what we'll be doing over the future. So there's a huge piece of work that we're going through now, which is to essentially ask the question of, so what, what should we be doing? Uh, does my team uh, primarily have responsibility for? What are our views on markets? How do we address those? Um, and I suspect we'll, we can kind of bring those out in questions as we talk about different, different issues. I think when I think about 2030, uh, really the biggest theme that we'll be uh, exposed to in that sort of time, for, time horizon is climate change. Um, we heard an election discussion uh, of uh, net zero economy of, of something like 2030 or certainly sooner than the government's commitments uh, currently legislated for of, of 2050. So we're very keen to understand uh, really how to protect our portfolios from those risks. This is not to say that we are climate scientists or that we are uh, thinking in depth about uh, the link between, uh, you know, different emissions activities and, and, and temperatures. There is a huge body of science and expert opinion for us to plug into there with the, the IPCC, which is the UN's body, and the Committee for Climate Change here, which is the, the UK's climate change advisor. So when you read their advice and you think about essentially what the government is going to have to react to, uh, it's very clear that they're going to have to uh, encourage the private sector uh, and that could be a euphemism in the later half of this decade, uh, but encourage the private sector and the economy as a whole to get to a net zero type uh, position. When you currently have assets of something like nine billion pounds uh, and you look forward to being a, a 50 to 60 billion pound scheme, you can very much see that there's a very big distinction between how you invest those new contributions coming into the scheme uh, versus what you do with the current portfolio. So we're working hard now to design essentially the climate change portfolios that uh, we will put into place. Um, I'm often seen on, on, on conferences talking about responsible investment. We are an integrated responsible investor. I think it's very important that all of our investment discussions are, are uh, take responsible investment and, and ESG into account. And that comes from a fiduciary duty uh, to make sure that any risks we think have, might have a financial impact on members are incorporated into the portfolio. So um, really climate change, I think, is going to be a very material theme for us and, and of course, the wider economy in future. Um, but quite often I get sort of accused of talking about divestment when I talk about climate change. And I'm very keen to make the distinction between uh, not buying coal assets and deciding where to, to, to put that money. So there's a difference between not buying and, and, and selling a legacy asset. So we're not talking about divestment. It's very important that we go and engage with uh, what I'd frame as the brown economy. Uh, a lot of those companies will have uh, uh, technologies and, and be part of the, the, the solution. Uh, but really it's to say that we need to use the, the flows of those contributions to be finding uh, the green economy of the future and making sure that we're putting is, uh, the portfolio into a place that we can protect members for, for longer. That's all on a backdrop for us 
of the significant leverage of uh, costs and uh, essentially uh, the, the, the revenue that comes from the charges due to our increasing scale. So the nature of defined contribution and uh, the charge cap is, is a feature of those charges is that essentially the, the costs of administration uh, scale with the number of members you have. Uh, there is a, a, a kind of annual cost or an overhead on the basis of being a trust uh, and having to deal with an ever increasing regulatory burden. Uh, but once you've taken those out, you can see that essentially in the, the, the second half of the decade in, in particular, actually there is more and more uh, potential for us to get more both from uh, a sort of a, a fixed basis point uh, uh, allocation to investment and potentially to get leverage from those other costs on a basis point uh, cost diminishing as assets grow and, and being able to put more into the, the, the investment side. We are a not-for-profit scheme uh, or owned by a not-for-profit so there are no other sources of capital. We don't have shareholders that we can tap into um, but we need to be commercial in the way that we do that. So there's a lot of our uh, values and beliefs need to come into our governance process uh, and that is uh, particularly, I think, the main challenge between being run by a not-for-profit and needing to seek profits for members. So that's a very interesting challenge uh, and framework for us to be considering. What I hope to be spending on in the future um, is essentially those, those uh, private market assets that Michelle was just talking about. Uh, we recognise that there is a huge amount of value to be added to members' accounts by a sensible allocation to illiquid assets. Um, I do see that as a core part of, uh, you know, scaled institutional investment, whilst recognizing at the same time, we, we, we simply can't get ahead of ourselves uh, and essentially spend money that, that isn't in the coffers of, the, of, of BNC or, or, or the people's pension. So a lot of the work that we're doing is to try and understand exactly how do you build up uh, an appropriate uh, process to make sure that uh, we don't suffer the agent principal risks that come with, say, having a property team in-house. If you have a property team in-house, you have to be doing property deals. You get biased towards believing that there's value just because you have people. Well, we need to have uh, some ability to step above that and ask the difference between property infrastructure or listed equities. So how do you build a team uh, which enables you to sort of dip into every asset class that is available to you whilst uh, not being so biased because you've built up that team. I think that's a really interesting challenge for us. Um, we're very much at the foothills of that. So I think more illiquid assets, that's been a sort of theme in the market for a long time. I, I fundamentally believe that more, in, uh, more illiquid assets in DC uh, should be done and, 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 and will be done. Um, and then the, the, the final step of that is making sure that that can be done at an appropriate price. Um, we represent, I guess, 90,000 employers. Uh, in the olden days, that might have been 90,000 pension schemes. Well, it's clear that when you split those assets between 90,000 different uh, smaller pots and 90,000 different uh, institutional governance arrangements, you're, you're quite limited as to how much negotiating power you might have to go to private equity and, and essentially say two and 20 doesn't work for us or, or hedge funds and potentially three and 30 in this, in this world. So we know we have to be innovative. Um, whatever happens, the master trust market is not gonna price higher. You know, we're not gonna be starting to charge more uh, for the products that, that kind of ship has sailed. So we need to be making sure that we get more bang for the buck. So I'm very much focused on ensuring that we can get a clear line of sight to the members' objectives, to the governance through the trustees, uh, and making sure that we have the right team to be able to focus on that and add value from, from those different opportunities. And, and as I say, a particular one being climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nico, and fascinating to see the inside of your house as well. That's one of the great yeah, benefits of chances. video conferencing. <laughs> so now let's go over to, to Denise and see the inside of her house as well. At least I hope we can. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Denise. Sadly, oh, we, good. Good we can't. We can't. Oh, we can see I'm you. Brilliant. I'm saying thank you to the uh, PLSA team for letting me join in remotely. I'm, I'm very sorry not to be able to join you in person. And it does seem a bit bizarre because we can't see the audience, but I'm sure you're there. Um, <coughs> mind over markets as the theme of this conference couldn't possibly be more apt and given the circum current circumstances. 
And we've just uh, heard and received an ambitious, or I think it's ambitious, budget from Rishi Sunak, where he's announced 30 billion that's been pledged to deal with the um, coronavirus alone. Now, that's not something to sneeze at. Sorry, bad joke. I had to throw one in. <laughs> uh, I remember asking a, a really good, close mentor of mine in, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, as the markets were tumbling around us, he said, I, I asked him, what do we do now? And uh, he said, keep your head down. And I said, well, for how long? And he said, well, about 20 years was his, his answer. Well, fortunately, that didn't really materialize, particularly in the equity markets. We've had a very good run. Um, and 20 years may seem like a long time, but is it really for pension funds uh, like us? For, for, for many of us, particularly in, in DB and DC schemes, we, we will be paying pensions well beyond 20 years, more like 100 years for, for the LGPS. Um, and this applies to you know, perhaps a shorter time horizon for closed schemes, but we're still all long-term investors. And so as such, it's never been more important to, for us to exercise our fiduciary duties and the responsible and prudential stewardship of our beneficiaries' assets more than it is today. So I've been asked to give a short overview of the Brunel Pension Partnership and its role within the local government pension scheme, which I'll refer to as the LGPS. I'll also talk a little bit about the benefits of, and pitfalls of pooling within the LGPS and for the private sector schemes many of whom are still relatively small and might welcome the opportunity to, to see improvements in their own governance. Um, and that includes, as we've heard from Nico, the benefits of scale that come from consolidation and the opportunity to reduce costs and um, improve efficiency. It also represents opportunities to invest in asset classes where scale you may have prohibited in the past, like what we heard with alternatives, private markets and infrastructure. Um, Brunel is roughly the same size as Michelle's scheme, roughly 30 billion pounds. Well, last time I looked, I don't know what it is today, but somewhere around there uh, in assets. And we manage the um, investments for nine counties, mainly those in the southeast and the Environment Agency. As such, responsible investment and ESG is very high on our agenda. Uh, we've got some 700,000 members and uh, 2,100 employees. But Brunel is really just a small part of the LGP scheme in aggregate. In aggregate, it has some 300 billion in assets and just under 6 million members and uh, approximately 18,000 employers. It, it ranks as one of the top, uh, the world's largest pension funds. It's all consistently in the top 10. But in the eyes of the government in the UK, however, the LGPS is one scheme. And that was the driver in 2016 when George Osborne announced the mandation of pooling. Um, three years down the line, the original 89 pension funds within the um, LGPS have morphed into eight so-called pools, um, and by any scale, these are all very large funds. So um, having been through this pooling exercise, I sometimes get asked for advice by some private sector schemes who are considering consolidation, either through master trusts or super funds, mergers, etc. They want to hear about our experience and how it has been and how's, how it's worked. And I would stress three key factors to consider. The first one is political will with a small p. Um, and this has to start from the very top of the organization at board level. If there isn't sincere desire from the top to consolidate, it simply won't work, or at best, it'll limp along with some half-baked plan. The second thing I would say is to watch out for a fear of subsidiarity. I remember when we pooled, I wasn't with Brunel then, um, I said to my, my team, I don't really mind who we pool with providing we're in charge. I, I said this half jokingly, of course, but for those who doubt others' ability to govern as well as they think they do, I would suggest that it's really important to view it as a partnership. Um, all st stakeholders must be fully engaged and feel that they are equals to make it work. And the third thing is compromise and, um, and uh, adaptability. It was hugely important for the LGPS to approach, uh, to approach pooling with eyes wide open. It um, hadn't been done on such a large scale in, before within the UK. And often we were learning as we went along from a legal regulatory perspective and just practical issues of building, putting offices together, et cetera. There often were no rules and some things are still relatively unclear. We are still learning. Um, that said, it's, it's remarkable, quite remarkable, how much has been achieved um, in, in a very short period of time, in less than three years. 
I'm sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. I'll do that now. That's the BBC <laughs> announcing something, but I'll look at it later. Um, some pools have already achieved over 50% of their transitioning of their underlying assets. And um, overall, there has certainly been a lot more investment in alternatives, in parti uh, particularly in infrastructure, which was one of the uh, objectives of the government. Uh, the interest we've already heard in responsible investment has gone through the roof. And we recognize not everyone is at the same stage in, in, in that journey. In our case, the Environment Agency has played a huge role in uh, uh, raising awareness across our pool and, and beyond. Um, our other clients are now pressing really hard for training and for help with ESG in general and cha climate change in particular. They're not all in the same place, but the important thing is that they want to do the right things for their members. And this is a global trend that we're all aware of and that is not is, and is here to stay and, and will not go away in my view. But um, through this pooling exercise, not everything is perfect and it's not surprising, nor should we be afraid to take stock after a period of time of to pause and reflect what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and Nico mentioned you know, the sheer amount of regulatory change and for the LGPS delays and some guidance, the outcome of some legal cases like the McLeod case causes us some worry. Um, and not knowing where that will take us makes planning a little bit harder. So do we wait things to happen or do we shape our own destiny? You know, there are no easy answers to any of these things. But I'm of the view that we should seize opportunities as and when we see them and uh, not be afraid to innovate. Uh, there are several opportunities out there if we want if we want to pursue and as I've said before, if we have a will to do so. In hindsight for the LGPS, perhaps we should have started with pooling our pensions administration teams rather than our assets. Um, it's a good opportunity to clean data, uh, which believe me, not all data is equal. Uh, and you know that's so important because it informs the actuarial valuation assumptions and in turn uh, strategic asset allocation. Uh, that's not what we've done, but there's still a good case to be made to consider doing so in retrospect. Uh, we know how difficult it is across the UK to recruit pensions administration staff and, and the consolidation of administration for us within the LGPS and, any, and I'm sure elsewhere uh, should help in that respect. In the, in the bigger picture, Further consolidation in the pools and certainly in the private sector seems probable in the me medium term. However, the question is, will this, is this something that will evolve organically or will it be mandated? Um, what seems clear is that the current structure and sheer number of funds is not sustainable over time if we are serious about improving governance and, um, and efficiency across pension funds in general. The question must always remain what is best for our funds and more importantly, our beneficiaries in, in the long term. That may seem obvious, but we constantly have to remind ourselves of that. Um, and we only need to look abroad to see what has been achieved and to inform uh, where we might go on the journey that we, the LGPS and others have yet to travel. And Brunel recently had a board away day and we invited Schroeders to talk to us about some benchmarking best practice for asset pools uh, this was based on some research they did with similar uh, similar funds, uh, pooled funds in other countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Some of the key issues in the evolution of those funds uh, of our colonial cousins um, were the maturity, governance, clients, what they looked like, budgets, staffing, remuneration, and performance, all you know, all absolute common sense issues, but things that had to be addressed specifically in order to make that transition to the pools and to better governance overall. And quite separately in 2017, the World Bank Group um, published the evolution of the Canadian pension uh, model. Um, as they matured, uh, these funds had some characteristics in common in their later stages of, of development. They, had they were an in independent professional entity with strong governance, they had the ability to attract top global talent. They had highly diversified investments, sophisticated investment teams, professional plan administration, good data management, modern technology, strong client servicing, good plan and design. Uh, assets and liabilities were well funded and, were, and the funding was sustainable. And they had pro proactive improvements in legislation and, and regulation. As we mature here in the UK, what might good look like for us? 
Um, one thing that was common to the evolution of all those funds um, was that it took time, um, a period of 10, 15 plus years. So to move along where we should be focused for 2020 and where we are focused, Schroeder's identified three key themes for us to examine. The first of those was our culture. Um, establishing a strong culture is just as important, if not more important than our structures and our processes. You've got to find your own alpha. We can all tick the right boxes, but what makes us different and what makes us special? Um, so the second was sustainable investment. As long-term investors in, in the public eye, increasingly funds are using, universally looking at ESG and responsible investment. And there's an ever-growing sense of urgency to address this in our investment practices as we've already heard from Nico. And the third is governance evolution. Many funds are increasing their internal resources and managing more in, in, in assets in house. We also see increasing collaboration and cooperation with peer funds for smaller funds. The key here is to try to continuously achieve better governance overall. If we get those three themes right, culture, sustainable investment, and good governance evolution, then we will see stronger pension funds across all sectors with good value propositions for their beneficiaries. We can then all focus on forging better futures by investing for a world that's worth living. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Right, well, I have had quite a few questions come in through the app, so I think we'll start taking a few of those now. So um, one of them was, you all represent massively big schemes. So you know, is there any way that the smaller schemes in the audience can take some of these ideas that you've got or do you actually need scale for things like the private markets investment that we were talking about? You know, should, are we looking for consolidation? Do we have to go for the pooling that, that Denise has gone to? You know, or can some of these ideas work for smaller individual schemes? I'll start with Michelle because you're right next to me sure. and get your views on that. Sure. Uh, it's funny, we, I think of this often, uh, especially since I have been recently imported from a colonial cousin. You may tell by my accent, I'm Canadian and I've uh, only been here about a year. The firm I worked for in Canada was quite large, significantly larger than RailPen is. And so I've asked myself a few times, in, we're about 30 billion pounds at RailPen, we're scheduled to be roughly in the next 10 to 15 years about 50 billion. Is that big enough? Is that big enough to do how much more in private assets? And I'd like to address, but we don't have to do it now, Nico's comment around the allocation to private equity and that once you have an in-house team, the insatiable need to keep feeding it. There's some thoughts there I'll share. But I, from my, and this, I don't have a lot of science around this, perhaps just a bit of experience and uh, intuition. I think to practically do private assets, and what I mean by that is infrastructure last, private equity first, uh, you need to be... It, it, to make it cost effective in all the fixed infrastructure and governance you required, including systems, operations, risk management, uh, and to pay the price for the salary, the headcount is what is your biggest expense, to attract them to the opportunity to do it for you in-house, needs to be north of 30 billion pounds. I think in the sweet spot is closer to 50. Um, the firm I worked for in Canada was 175 billion pounds of dollars, <laughs> and we had uh, 30 and 40 person infrastructure, private equity teams, et cetera, and a, probably a thousand person real estate company dedicated to do about 50 billion dollars uh, of real estate assets. And so that was massive scale and was starting to get a bit too big. But I do think the 30, 50 billion pound size makes sense for investing in some of the private assets. But as a smaller player, I think there's opportunities, and we're starting to do that more with some smaller peers, to uh, do joint venture, to collaborate on individual transactions, perhaps that haven't built the infrastructure that we have. Thank you, Michelle. Now, if I could go to Nico and then Denise for comments on that. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I think, I think what's very difficult is to do it with a value for money outcome. So you can certainly buy into any funds as a smaller scheme. Um, you know, there's, there's a, walk outside into your hall, there'll be a number of different managers who wish to sell them to you. I think the issue is uh, paying a reasonable value for that when a lot of the risk from their side is the operational size, uh, do, operational risk due to the size of your investment. Um, you can use your consultant to go and find them. You can uh, essentially go through a beliefs exercise, which is much more led from your consultant than from an in-house team. 
those solutions are, are, are kind of available to you. I think it will come down to, you know, we, we, we've just had an interest rate cut. Uh, yields on assets are going to be lower. Um, whether private markets can weather that storm or not, whenever you have a lower returning asset class, the fee becomes ever more important. Um, and if you can't access private markets in a, you know, and believe in the return, uh, that you get a you know an excess return for the illiquidity premium, then it's not worth it for you. So I think you need to go and challenge that element of it. Um, and if you are comfortable and you understand the opportunity set and you have a consultant who can take you through that and, and select a manager for you, then absolutely your size shouldn't be a, you know an impediment to that. Um, I'd also, I mean, as a former consultant who worked for a fiduciary manager business, um, I would point out that there is reasonable pooling. Uh, through that route, that you don't have to be pulled formally through, uh, you know, merging your scheme into other people. So you can be using uh, some of those solutions, and they'll be they will be very much targeted at you. So I think there's a lot of different routes there, but I think you need to make sure you've got the cynicism uh, built into your selection process because you know pretty much everyone you're going to encounter is going to be telling you how fantastic this is. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to be mm -hmm. the ones who are challenging that question. Mm -hmm. It may be the right answer, but you need to be going through that process yourself. Yeah. I Thanks, think, Mika. Uh, yeah, sorry, Michelle, you know, I just want to jump in, that, yeah. if you don't mind. I don't mean Denise to step in, but I, I think what's especially important is that we watch the public markets shape, uh, change shape so much. Uh, I have recently learned that since 2000, the number of public companies traded on the UK exchanges have dropped from 12,000 to only 5,000 uh, available names. And the private companies within the UK in that same period have grown from 1 million to 4 million. So it's, there's an opportunity cost here if one doesn't prepare itself to be able to participate in these private assets. The public markets are just waning in size and availability to us all. Secondly, the cost, as many ways, as Nico suggested, to do private assets, from the most expensive to the cheapest, can be as much as five or seven times more. When I say in-house, meaning doing direct, direct in specific transactions. And lastly, I think any private asset manager you hire, you have to have a belief and you take a risk. They're putting assets on your books that will remain far longer than they ever stick around for. And you are taking bigger risk hanging your hat on them. There's very little due diligence one could do to get that confident in it, but be able to bring that in-house gives you control, gives you governance, gives you stronger risk management. So there's a real strong offset to the cost benefit there that sometimes doesn't get measured. Sorry, Denise. No, it's fine. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, every, you've all mentioned some really good things. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, in this, in this space, we were talking, Nico and I, a bit earlier that um, what you need, really needs to look out at is what, how experienced the people that you do business with, the GPs and or even the funds, that how, whether they've been through a credit cycle yeah. before. Because there are a lot of people who just haven't been through that. And so, and, you know, we're in a covenant light world. Um, uh, the, so, you know, the, the due diligence is really important, particularly for first funds. Um, you know, you really have to pick up the phone and ask what the track record is of these individuals. You can't just leave it to take someone's word for it. So that makes it a little bit harder for smaller funds, but it doesn't exclude them. We have to remember that the very large funds, like from where Michelle came from, you know, for them, they need to write really big tickets to move the needle. And that creates opportunities in smaller deals that are just as, 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 um, as worthwhile considering. And the point about the shrinking listed markets is a very good one, because we have seen in recent years how the smart money has migrated to private markets, irrespective of what we might think of the pricing um, in those markets. There's a huge amount of innovation that is really changing the world that's going on in those markets. And it's not Main Street stream nobody knows about, whether it's batteries to operate buses in, in um, in, in India, that's you know is helping pollution hugely. No one's talking about these things, but that's all being funded through the private markets. Okay. So, you know, you need to find someone who has a really good track record and that you can work with closely. Once you've established that trust, it is very much a relationship business. Um, so, you know, once you have established that trust, but you also need to be relatively nimble mm -hmm. because there's still a huge wall of money out there. Yeah. But I will finish by saying one thing is that this market correction may create some unexpected opportunities. If people have over allocated to private markets, 
they may be finding themselves as the equity markets correct over allocated and they may become forced sellers and that crew may create some good opportunities because the stuff that they'll be able to sell will almost invariably be the good stuff mm -hmm. so for those who have a bit of uh, dry powder on the side watch out for those some of those opportunities that may come along Great. Thank you very much for that, Denise. So sort of follow-on question that we've got through on the iPad is particularly for, for you, Nico, which is the, the challenge of holding illiquids within a daily priced environment for DC. I know it's one you've thought about, so I will throw it to you now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, um, again, the scale answer comes, come in, comes into this as well. Uh, so we used to be uh, accessing our funds through essentially USIT or, or, or life company regulated fund of funds wrappers and uh, people will know there's a lot of FCA regulations that come into how they need to be structured to enable people to, to, to receive liquidity. Um, those, I, I think there was a consultation the other day about those rules. But fundamentally, that's a retail uh, set of concerns, um, and we'd see, uh, you know, the Woodford for, for, uh, Woodford experience over 2019 is sort of demonstrating those, right? So, in a world where people all try and take their money tomorrow, then absolutely those kind of uh, liquidity constraints or, or illiquidity constraints are very important. Uh, we moved away from that kind of life uh, company or USIT wrapper for the fund of fund investment. Uh, because we needed to be able to uh, do a number of different things uh, around those regulations and essentially sit under uh, trust regulation. So under trust regulation, the trustees are essentially sovereign. Um, so for instance, changing the asset allocation of our diversified growth fund should be primarily a decision of the trustee under advice that, you know, they need to take section 36 advice, but that shouldn't need to go to another product committee uh, run by an outsource provider to take three months longer, you know, that that is just grit in the system. That's just friction um, that we didn't feel the need to do. Uh, and then one of the other benefits is the ability for us to essentially say, well, uh, we can decide uh, the level of liquidity that, that, that those funds uh, target. Uh, we can decide, uh, you know, the, the kind of mark to model uh, pricing mechanism, the pricing and equity between our members uh, is a very important part of this. Uh, we can decide essentially to store up the dry powder to do big ticket deals or have a direct feed into smaller ticket deals. So all of those things are essentially pieces that uh, the fund manager of a kind of uh, a fund of fund structure would have. Uh, and by moving essentially to a custody model, so we use um, a custodian uh, to directly hold uh, units. So we, we have about so what do we have, 12 uh, different UCIT or life company funds within that pool. So at the moment, we don't do any liquid assets uh, at all, um, but we have the ability to then essentially put alongside that something illiquid, uh, invest in those GP, LP structures. Uh, one of the things we've been able to do with that structure as well is to have our currency hedging sitting outside of each of those different funds. So we can hedge at an aggregate level for the portfolio and, and kind of not individually within each of those portfolios. So that's achievable with scale. Um, I don't know what the kind of bite point is for that to be uh, uh, cheaper than essentially having a fund the fund manager or a DGF, but I suspect it is uh, into the billions. Um, but certainly we, you know, one of the advantages for that is to give us the potential to do a liquid assets into the future. Thanks, Nico. There were some questions around how you get the, the costs down for these things as well. Is that just a, a benefit of scale? Or is there any other secret source that you've got that you could let us know how we get those two and twenties a bit lower? Well, so um, as I say, we haven't we haven't done that as yet. Um, I think it's the difference. Um, I'll, I'll, I, someone said to me once: uh, the great thing about having three billion guaranteed a year um, is that you can tell everyone your plans and no one can steal them. Really. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll let you into to some secrets. Um, I think what you do is you, so when you've got your trustees, uh, you know, through the, the decision process to do illiquid assets and say they make a 10% allocation to, to illiquid overall, then you can go to the market and say, look, that means every single month we have 25 million pounds of contributions coming in. Uh, that certainty of regular cash flows into illiquid assets, in, into any manager, uh, is very valuable. So. 
uh, the ability for them to know, hey, if we have 25 uh, million pounds of deal pipeline a month, um, uh, or an average, uh, then then essentially we we have a guaranteed uh, buyer um, that is very very valuable. So I think rather than being essentially a price taker, the scale enables you to go and be a price maker. So um, I I think it, that is a, a, a solution of scale. Um, I would expect um, over time again that kind of pooling solution of scale to to, to come into force. Whether that comes through a sort of fiduciary management. Uh, space. I think you can probably uh, see some of those solutions there already. Whether that comes um, through a government intervention, um, so you know, uh, ideas like the patient capital review last year. Um, I suspect at some point the government will come to the industry and talk to us about climate change and the need for uh, significant investments in in energy and uh, transport infrastructure, um, and needing to get the pension industry together to go and do that. You know, the scale of some of those climate change challenges is so much bigger than, you know, any individual participants in the industry, however big we get. Um, so I think that the, the trying to aggregate us uh, to go and, you know, speak to the market with something guaranteed in terms of saying, look, every, every month we can go and put a certain amount of, of money, of contributions into those kinds of deals. Um, maybe that becomes a joint venture, so we get a profit share. Uh, maybe that becomes a fund that they can go and market externally to, to the third party clients. Uh, there's a number of different routes there, but I think, um, you know, the, the, the scale and in-house team gives you the uh, ability to, to go and be innovative in that space. And, and we need some innovation. Thank you, Nico. So uh, amazingly, we are running towards the end of the session, which does seem to have gone very, very quickly. We did start five minutes late, so will give us five minutes to discuss. So really, I think I'd like to go to everyone and just get your views on what you think the investment model of the future is going to be. You know, how will we actually get returns? So we've heard quite a lot about private markets, still quite a lot of questions coming in about private markets. Also, some of the questions have come in about in-house management. You know, can, can we really be sure that, that that's the right way? Are we absolutely certain we're going to get value for money from the in-house management? And how do we test that? So perhaps as you're thinking about, you know, what this model of the future, what our investment styles are going to look like in 10 years' time, pick up on some of those questions as well in just a few minutes each. So I'm not really asking an awful lot <laughs> of my panellists, but I'm going to do that anyway, because you're all so great. So, Michelle, do you want to start? And maybe some of that in-house stuff. I think you had some views on that. Oh, that's a big question. It's a big question. So, yeah, Can model I... 10 year in the future yeah. and thinking around in-house management too. Can I be a bit provocative? Please do. Okay. So instead of giving an answer around the investments and the asset side of it, because I think we've talked a fair bit about that, I'm going to speak more about um, strategic nature of managing an investment company because I think we have to remember for our firms, and I think it's for all three of us, we're not just investment firms, we're pension investment firms. And what that means is we're managing pensions for the purpose, uh, we're managing our assets for the purpose of a liability. And I always get a little worked up when we attend events like this and we speak so heavily about assets and investments and strategy and leverage and currency. Really, what really matters and what makes most of the difference is how we align these assets to the liabilities. So I think the future involves more actuarial innovation. I think more understanding of how to provide maximum benefit to these beneficiaries. I notice we haven't talked about the member very much today. That's why we're here. We need to be far more member sensitive. We need to build stronger fiduciary capabilities which align the nature of those liabilities to our assets. These liabilities are quite well understood. Being able to model a liability cash flow is actually really concrete. Present valuing it to today at some discount rate and measuring a, a, the value of the liability, ridiculous. But being able to understand what those cash flows are, that's all the assets are. Assets are just a stream of cash flows that we've contracted. We need to understand the nature of how they work together. So breaking out those liabilities, understanding the risk characteristics of it, marrying our asset risk characteristics to it. For instance, inflation. So that's one comment. The other I'd say is leverage. I think the use of leverage and the understanding of different forms of beta and risk factors is far more important than even putting the asset classes on the books. I think we 
need to put more attention on how we build the asset allocation based on an ALM framework to match the liabilities. We'll get more bang for a buck and maximum returns out of that than trying to cherry pick a single asset or ping a single private equity manager. I think those bottom up decisions are significantly less important in such a paradigm where we're shifting so heavily towards longevity risk. Becoming eat, the risk of eating cat food when one's 96 is really growing and we forget to talk about it. And we need equities and long-term cash flows to be able to offset that. And the science, or the art and science that helps protect members' longevity risk is not well thought out inside of our asset strategies. Well, that's Thank you, Michelle. That's what great. For, I imagine. No, no, that, that is good. I like that. And then, Denise, can I go to you now? Because I think one of the other things that you were really bringing out was, was the, the climate risks. And, and again, some of the challenges that, that we often get, particularly around DC, is you know, there's no point retiring really wealthy in a world that is totally uninhabitable. So you know, climate has got to be an important factor. So what are your views of what the investment of the future looks like, Denise? Well, Fundamentally, we still have to, to um, remain focused on the golden rules of, rent, of portfolio management, including asset liability, optimization, all those things that Michelle has already said. But as I said in my opening piece, you know, if we center around the three things, responsible investment, good governance, and culture, if you have those three things right, then you are in a position to invest in good, sustainable companies, and, and not invest in companies that may not be around in 10 years. And that's a very real thing that we're not necessarily looking at our, our investment brick as, as opposed to uh, looking at how, what our risk profiles look like with, within the assets that we own. So definitely we have to be thinking about what's sustainable for the future. And on Nico's point, uh, the government is looking to, um, to investors and, and big asset pools to work with them and I know our pool is involved with um, the Prince of Wales' A4S sustainability uh, group. Um, and in fact, we were one of the pioneers who, who established that network. And we will be working with, um, with the government on COP26 um, if it happens in Glasgow or in London, wherever it would be. But we have, we have a huge rule, uh, role to play in influencing the way the world goes in a sustainable manner. And it's, it is the fiduciary man, uh, responsibility to do so. Still is a question for some, but I question that whether we, we would be negligent of our um, fiduciary responsibilities if we ignored it. And I think that's where we are today. That's great, Denise, thank you. So Nico, you have two minutes for the, the final summing up of what you think the investment strategy for the future will be. Just had one question coming in. I'm also thinking about the influence of external government forces because some things we're being dictated to at the moment as well. How will that play into our investment strategies? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess the, so I, I just wanted to endorse those two uh, points. Um, previously from Michelle and Denise. Um, I think those are both very important themes. I think, um, yeah, the, the, the government is, is, I think, always going to be a very important influence, but probably not a, at an investment level. I think um, possibly for the first time we've seen, you know, the, the narrative around the pensions bill talking about climate risk, um, that's not enforcing any kind of particular investment strategy. Um, and I think it's important that, that uh, you know, the members in the room uh, understand that, that I really see as an extension of TPR's duties around uh, funding risk and, and the categorization of risk. So that's just trying to harmonize the measures of climate risk uh, and giving the regulator powers to intervene where those risks don't seem to be taken into account. So I, I, I think that's the kind of level of influence you're going to see from the government. I don't think you're going to see um, or it would be very unusual for us to see the government say, you need to have 10% in wind farms or whatever it is. I don't think that's going to be their attitude. Um, I just wanted to pick up a kind of another theme to add to the model of the future, which is really on that public-private markets kind of shift. I think with technology now, um, we're going to see much more ability for bigger investors to invest in smaller companies. So um, there's a real buzzword that's been talked around the industry, which is probably meaningless, which is blockchain. Um, but really, what does that mean? It means micro access, uh, micro finance platforms of, uh, of brokerage uh, and accessing uh, both debt and equity and, and estate uh, 
uh, from companies um, who never would previously have been the subjects of uh, institutional investment. Um, I, I think there has been a master. If you look at the, you know, the description of uh, fewer and fewer companies are, are listed, I think that's 100 percent accurate. The economy as a structure has got more concentrated towards bigger companies, but there are still millions of smaller companies in Britain. I'm sure there's approaching billions of companies around the world who need financed. Um, when I think about sustainability, I think about us taking the capital of labor uh, and then financializing it. Well, actually, if we make sure that that uh, in some way reinvests in the, in the places that those, those, um, those people earn those wages, then we have a circular economy. Um, I think there is, the 21st century is going to be very different to the 20th. I don't think we're going to be relying on the Chicago School uh, market efficiency narrative, which says that, you know, a worker in a uh, workshop should invest in the other side of the planet. Um, I think a bit of economic nativism is probably going to be a part of the future. Um, uh, that's not meant to be extreme. Um, I think that's a, that's a semi-inevitable uh, kind of reaction to, to what we're seeing and, you know, that kind of theme of why we Brexit. Um, so I, I think the institutional investor of the future, and maybe 2030 is a reasonable time, time frame to start thinking about that, will be able to access smaller companies more locally um, and be kind of seeing the economy as their playpen as opposed to just the mega cap listed companies. So that I certainly would hold up that hope. Brilliant. Well, thank you all. Thank you for your questions. And I'd really like to thank my fabulous panel. So thanks to Michelle for being here in person and to Nico and Denise for being here via video conference. Thank you very thank much. You.